Um, what we're going to do is, as mentioned, we do a bit of a presentation about the, the background to all this and what we actually develop. Go outside, have a look at the bot and see some of the tasks that it's doing, and then come back inside and do some Q and A, um, as well as really what we would like to get is some constructive feedback. Uh, because this is the first time, we're not assuming that this robot is the final end product or anything like that. What we'd really like to be able to see is what, um, you know, what, how should we take it? What are the next sets of developments that we should be looking at over the coming year in order to make this a lot more relevant to, to your needs? So in the presentation, I'm just going to kind of talk about the background a little bit more, um, how we got to it, some of the example videos that show what it's been doing in the past before we go outside to the demo. So just to kind of give you a bit of a, a backdrop, um, what we looked at was some analysis of what's going on out there in the industry, try and get out of the way, um, and, and see what's going on there within precision, precision ag within the grazing livestock industry, what we can see and how we can judge it is a lot slower than some of the other industries. So one of the things we thought about is, okay, what can we do about precision ag over such a large area and, and dealing with it in that way? Being able to, there is starting, you know, we're starting to build up and collect a lot more data around pasture and livestock through remote sensing and RFID tags. Can we tap into that? Can we start to use those current technologies and tools that are out there and start to pull that into these robotic systems? And they're starting to become some software systems that are out there that are allowing us to take in that data and make analysis about pasture quality, for example. And again, how can we provide that type of information or use that type of information in, in the robotic system as well? There are some challenges when it comes to robotics in this particular type of industry. Um, it's unstructured environment, ditches, rocks, tree stumps, everything, right? And so building a low cost, highly dexterous, maneuverable type of robot is quite difficult, right? You can do it, but the cost starts to increase and there's trying to figure out what that balancing act is between it all. We're practically building a, a military style type of robot to work all terrain kind of capabilities, but trying to do it at a low cost. Uh, there are long distances or large areas that we have to deal with um, and hence the type of energy consumption that we're trying to look at. How do you make a robot that works over long duration of time is quite complex. Um, we're starting to look at solar electric capabilities, whether we want to have electric diesel type of capability or some sort of electric engine type capability as well. But again, how do you keep a low cost? Um, one of the biggest issues that we have in this particular industry compared to other ag industries is the fact that we have moving animals and that's the that's really a, a large complexity so at the moment now the closest that we can get to in terms of the types of technologies that are out there is you may have seen things like the google car um, where you can actually start to track pedestrians and how pedestrians are moving in the roadways and they're using that as a mechanism for safety that's the closest you get to this space the difference is with Humans are a little bit more predictable because you've structured an environment. There are footpaths, there are roadways, there are traffic lights. You kind of build that into the system. While here you've got 200 to 500 to 600 kilogram beasts moving around. They can do so randomly and that becomes quite complex. So how do you track those moving animals and deal with the robotic system is also quite complex. And finally, being able to translate the data into decision points, especially being able to do that in real time so a robot can actually make decisions in the middle of the night while you're asleep, somewhere out there in the middle of the farm, that's really what we're trying to deal with as well. And that's a, that's a major challenge you know, from a robotics perspective. So the challenges on the left is what we're seeing from the industry. The challenges on the right, um, uh, the aspects of robotics. But there are some significant opportunities. If we can do real-time pasture biomass, for example, feed on offer, that would be quite significant. But at some point, we've got to understand from you guys, where is that, you know, what, what are the biggest economic drivers for you? Because that really helps us focus on what we need to look at first. Yes, it can do a whole bunch of things, but we need to kind of target that first thing and then that, all those other things will come out of it. So if there's any understanding from you guys about, look, it's lost cows, it's pests, it's, I mean, that's where our pain points are, then we can start to, to drive on that. Sorry. I just, um, it's, we've digressed a bit past where I was going to jut in, um, but... There has been a lot of work done, and you guys probably know about it as much as I do, with AWI looking at a Bluetooth, um, an, an ear tag for an animal that has Bluetooth capabilities. It's solar, solar RAM. And um, just talking about some of the things about being able to identify animals. If, you know, if, if an animal had a tag that had a Bluetooth capability that could talk to the bot and the drone. So, and they also have, um, we're looking at developing a tag with a bit of thermo, um, detection uh, capabilities, so looking at welfare animals that are sick, um, 
you know, we, we know that sick animals have a temperature, you know, a normal animal, a healthy animal has a temperature range of X, Y, Z, depending on the species. We know that if they're ill, it'll most likely be higher. And, the, and it's, you know, that's the first thing the vet does is take a temperature and we come out and go sick animal. So if we can, if we have a tag that can monitor the animal's temperature and say, we've got an animal over X, Y, Z temperature, talk to the bot, the bot send it to your phone or whatever, then that's a real capability. Yeah. integrated a, a linear actuator with a, a spot spray unit and a, um, a drill for taking soil samples. targeted weeds management at the individual um, plant level and, and also make the process of soil sampling Uh, you've seen a demo, you can see kind of the capabilities that are there. I showed you the video of where it was across the whole farm and the things that we could do, what we've done across there as well. Um, and as I mentioned, we have one year of some quite significant funding which is going to allow us to put systems on there, redevelop parts of the algorithms, the software, either change it physically um, or do things physically, change it from in terms of intelligence or software internally within this, in the bot as well. Um, and really what we'd like to be able to do now, if it's okay with you guys, is just to kind of get some feedback on how you might use it, you know, and, and what you might, you know, what you don't like about it or what you think you might like about it, what we need to keep working on. I mean, that'd be good if we could kind of get that uh, feedback and if there's anyone that might want to start that, that process off for us and, and hopefully we just get the rest of the group going. I've got um, one question. With it, you talked about doing like aerial photos and detecting weeds and that. Is there any capability within it to just drive backwards and forwards across the paddock and pick up certain weeds that you want to spray and spray them for you without having to do the aerial part beforehand? Yeah, so so the idea of the aerial was to be able to cover large areas. Mm. And you may, or even, it could even be satellite imagery that gives you some identification of where weeds could be. And from that, the bot can go there. And it's going to have the internal capability to be able to detect weeds itself and be able to spray those weeds yeah. itself. So it might, you might know that within region A over here, we think with there's some serrated tussock. We don't know how many weeds in that region over there. When the bot goes there, it'll count individual serrated tussock, spray individual serrated tussock. So that would be the objective as well. Yeah, because I'm just thinking smaller plants. You're yeah, not even smaller than that. So, stuff, yeah, so yesterday I showed you the in the vegetable industry, the ability to be able to detect individual weeds. It's, it's a little bit harder here because what you have is 
is weeds growing on grass or whatever it might be. So it's just got a lot more complex than what it might be on a vegetable farm. Uh, the algorithms themselves that we developed are going to stay the same. There's these machine learning algorithms that we can use. What we have to do is we have to train those algorithms for each specific type of weed. And, and that, that's going to be time consuming, but it only gets done once. After that, the, the bot knows what that weed is and just sprays it every time it sees it. But yes, that's the objective. And the other thing that we've been told is things like, for example, just being able to go along fence lines and just spraying along mm. fence lines anyway. Yeah. So, you know, things like that. Yeah. Um, the other comment I'd just make to you is, like, the cattle in that video we saw all ran away. I'll be honest, our cattle are fairly quiet, and I'd be a bit concerned that instead they might run away initially and then the next thing they'd all come back. So, for example, we had a pig turned up on our place, and I couldn't work out why the entire mob of cows were standing looking at it. Well, they'd never seen a pig before. So... I'd be a little bit concerned. Sheep, I think, would be fine, but with cattle, I'd be a bit concerned that they might end up coming and then they'd start nudging it or whether. So whether you need to think about some alarm or something like that to put on it, so if they do come in too close, I was chases thinking, I was them away from it. Actually, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, so the the farmer that we showed you the demo at, there was two things. One was um, a certain type of call that would attract the animals, and just even recording his voice. And using that to play back is one thing, and the other, and the opposite of that is a warning sound or something like that as well. So they don't get too close, or well, they learn not to get too close. But I agree with you. I mean, that's also our um, one one of the first things I have is how do you maintain a certain standoff distance from the animals? So as you want to, I mean, part of the animal behaviour stuff that the ag scientists and the vet scientists will tell us is that we don't want to disturb the behaviour of the animals by having the presence of the bot. Yeah, so they can actually monitor what's going on. So we've got to maintain off that standoff distance. And if the animals want to get closer to us, is how do you kind of keep moving back safely um, to keep that distance away? You're absolutely right. So, well, well, that's my two cents. And I, one job I could see straight away actually was when you, you had to be on the video of feeding. Um, when you're initially feeding young livestock, lambs in particular, um, and it's drawing them onto the feed and getting them used to the feed, um, you know, straight away, it, it really handy use would be to. Um, I mean, obviously you'd be towing a trailer anyway, but if you could run it out of the ute, perhaps send a drone about to quickly verify where the sheep are and send that around to bring them into your, to your feed supply. Yeah. Um, you, you only have to do it a couple of times. That's right, yeah. So when you think of... You're absolutely right. So the um, fundamental capability there for us would be can we have the bot move to any location on the, on the farm? It can tow, that's great. How would it tow and drop off food and then move away from it? Well, you, you could still visually, uh, you still physically be there and, and put out your trail of grain or hay um, and then just direct the robot like a drone yeah. and just guide it and just run it around yeah. because, um, yeah, it's just a use I could see. No, no, you're absolutely right. And I, again, one of the things we heard from one of the growers yesterday was um, acting like a pipe piper. You know, so you know where good pasture is and yeah. the animals know that if they follow the bot they're going to get good pasture and if they learn that kind of behaviour then you're kind of moving them around. Yeah, if you could get it to open gates and shut gates it would be, yeah. be good. Or some kind of gate latch system that yeah. it could operate. Well, you know how we're going to do it. We just put some roller doors and the bot talks to it and zooms up. Yeah. On the farm, so what are the capabilities that you can't do at the moment now as growers could we put onto the bot? So you have being able to detect it, something that hasn't moved for a long time, it's an animal that hasn't moved for a long time. How do you alert that back to the farmer? Um, change detection is a relatively easy concept now within robotics. It's been, as a, as a sensor and algorithms, it's been done over the last 15 years. So if I can come along and monitor all your fence lines and say, that's what they look like now, and the next time I go over, the robot just does literally an image-to-image -image detection process and notices if there's any differences, just an alert back to the farmer saying there's a difference in I don't know what it is, I don't know if it's a hole, I don't know what's going on, that's from a robot's perspective, but what it does know is that there's been change and alerting the farmer that there's been change and the farmer can come and say, don't worry about that, don't worry about that, I need to go worry about that. So yes, um, being able to do that is part of it. Yeah, is there some sort of um, obstacle avoidance system and how how that's sensed in Yeah, you know, so there are, there are going to be some things that it's going to be, that's easily detectable. So trees, for example, shrubs, large rocks. There are going to be other things that are going to be very hard to detect, such as, um, you know, where there's a ditch, but there's high grass or something like that, and not being able to sense below that. Um, so that's going to be, um, they're going to be critical things. Uh, fixed infrastructure is one of those things that I think can be quite easily done. So um, what, I showed, what we showed you outside was the ability for the bot to just follow some GPS waypoints. So our feeling is that any bot that's going to go onto a farm the first time is going to have GPS breadcrumbs given to it 
this is where you can travel. And everywhere where, is, where, where there isn't a GPS retcon, then you can't go there. For, yeah? And then what the farmer can do then is start to um, open that up a little bit more. So give it some safe areas and so forth. And being able to, so likewise, if you had a fixed fence line, being able to kind of map out what that fence line is, <coughs> telling the bot you can kind of not move along this, this line. Um, but even then, I mean, the, the GPS technology is quite expensive. So if you want to bring down the cost of GPS technology, we move away from two centimetres, maybe up to 50 centimetres. And so you, from a robot's perspective, <coughs> being able to move around 50 centimetres, you might say is pretty good, but um, that's okay from a, an absolute coordinate frame, where am I on the farm? But if I want to move up close and personal to something that's within five centimetres, I've got to move maybe to like a, a vision system on the robot that allows me to move up close. I can move. Yeah. 